Hello and welcome. I'm Daniel Glass, and I'm proud to be joining this webinar in my capacity as a member of the Board of Directors of UJA and also one of the co-chairs of the Entertainment, Tech, and Lifestyle Division. The last few weeks have been among the most devastating in Israel's history. Following the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th, UJA responded immediately. Thanks to the strength of our infrastructure and nonprofit we partner with on the ground. There's an expression in this building at UJA, which is, you don't build the fire department in the middle of a fire. So I'm really, really proud of everything the UJA had in place and was ready to do on the most macro level and the most micro level. Having that infrastructure already in place is something that for decades has been in assembled. The annual campaign, the luncheons, the breakfast, the dinners are what's all built that infrastructure. Today, in the next 30 minutes, we're gonna be joined by people and I will introduce them after. Uh, music icon, Clive Davis. Music attorney and board member, Doug Davis. Dahlia Kuznier, whose family members, sadly, Yair and Eitan are currently held hostage. Julie Swidler, the executive vice president of Sony Music and our CEO at UJA, Eric Goldstein. I was at a music festival on Saturday morning with my wife in Austin, Texas. When the news came in, the tragedy started pouring in. We did not know that a music festival massacre had occurred until a few hours later. And all we thought about was, where is the regard for human life? What is going on? I crafted a statement that has never been printed. And I'm sad to say I sent it and it was interviewed by one of our industry trades. I like to read it because no one's ever seen it or heard it. This was last week after I attended Mayor Eric Adams rally in New York. And by the way, he has been incredible. For those of you who are taking this call in London or in Israel or in Los Angeles, we are so proud of Eric Adams who's been there He's been using four words. We are not all right. We are not all right when women are raped and dragged through the street. We are not all right when babies are decapitated. So he has been incredible. But here's my statement. My family and I will be at the rally tonight near the UN showing our support for Israel and the innocent people living this nightmare. In the face of vicious hatred, we cannot be complacent. A music festival in Israel or anywhere is about peace, love, and harmony. It cannot be a battleground. The slaughter of innocent Jews had nothing to do with politics, borders, or religion. This is not about questions who should live where. This is a hateful terrorist group out to destroy, kidnap, rape, and murder. Our daughters, sons, brothers, sisters, parents, grandparents, friends, and family are being savagely murdered, their memories disrespected. The world cannot stand by silently in the face of such immense evil. As an industry, we must unequivocally denounce these unthinkable acts of terrorism. And I will add anti-Semitism. The ugly head has gotten out of the closet, and out of the curtains in the last few weeks, especially the last 10 days, and you see it. When Doug Davis and I spoke about this call with the leaders of the UJA, we noticed our industry, how sad everybody is how scared everyone is, how emotional, how lost. And we thought we must get together on this call, which will be seen by people as they get the link after. And what do people need in entertainment? What do they need in tech? They need guidance, they need a resource. I will promise you, the UJA will be there for you if you need UJA to come over to your meeting and meet with your staff one-on-one -on -one or one-on-100. -on -one we, we will be there as we have been there with every crisis, but this one is the worst I've ever experienced. We're much more than a gala. We're much more than a lunch or a breakfast. It is every day. And this will not be a quick fix. The trauma will last for months and months and months. And you'll hear from other speakers about it. You know, the doctrine and mandate of Hamas is the destruction of Israel, the destruction of the Jewish people. We must speak out. We cannot be silent. 
There's no respect for human life when you think about these atrocities. And I thought about it on the way here today. You don't need to be left-wing, liberal, religious, right-wing to denounce slaughter and barbarism. There is no sides. And raising three children in this city, we call it in our family civility and morality, which we must, must, must return to. So I thank everybody from the UJA for being here, for putting this together. And I hope, and Doug will speak later about it, that we bring ourselves a little bit more together. We're more compassionate for each other. And we sort this out together and we think about it. But please don't sit on the sidelines. That is what we hear today is to bring you together, let you know there is a place to turn. There are resources. And please, please, people need to hear a voice. You must stand with Israel. And you must stand up for what is right. So it is an honor to talk about this man who will be speaking next. He truly is an icon. Mr. Clive Davis has brought joy to all of our lives all over the world. If you're in Israel, or you're in Africa, or you're in Asia, or you're in South America, or you're in Brooklyn, Clive Davis has brought us the joy of music through some of the greatest songs and artists of all time. He transcends the generations, and I was so proud to know him as a family friend last week when he stood up as the leader in our business. And shame on a lot of people who did not, but Clive, thank you. Thank you for standing up and making that strong statement. It was eloquent, it was important, and I'm really, really proud to introduce Clive Davis. Two weeks ago, we didn't think we'd be here, but Clive, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. And please give us the reflections in this moment in time. Thank you. Well, I didn't want to sit on the sidelines. I was very upset at the recent press that was muddying how this nightmare began. And so I did uh, issue my statement, which I will read from. I wholeheartedly oppose the murderous hate displayed by Hamas on the people of Israel. And I support fully Israel's right to eradicate terrorism. This is a very, very personal and tragic um, fought and mission for me. I've experienced the extraordinary pain of anti-Semitism my entire life. This goes all the way back to when I was a boy and the soldiers returned from World War II with horrific images of the concentration camps. We are witnessing a truly dreadful human tragedy unfold before our eyes in the Middle East. Thousands of innocent Israeli people were ruthlessly murdered, many at a music festival, many so young, and I fear many more will die in the weeks to come. I have made it my mission in life to fight for equality and for human rights advocating for those who do not have a voice in music and elsewhere. You cannot be silent about anti-Semitism. You cannot be silent about hate or discrimination of any kind. I choose not to be silent about the evil of terrorism. Importantly, I also urge our leaders to seriously consider humanitarian rights and the preservation of innocent life in the days ahead. That was my statement, and I'm so happy to be with you today. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Dad. I'm sure you can all imagine how proud I am to have a father like him, who not only provides leadership to the family, but also our community and beyond. I love you, Dad. Thank you. When I spoke to him after this attack, he shared with me the thoughts that he made on this Zoom. He said, I was fortunate to only know it in my 51st year since he had known it his whole life. 
my own personal pain from all of this became a, a trauma and intergenerational trauma that hit me like a dam breaking. I had always been taught that it was possible. All Jewish children are taught this, but I had never seen it. The pain of the horrors in Israel was then followed by a new pain that came from here. It was the indifference that I just could not have ever fathomed. How we were all seeing the worst things we ever saw, and people were looking past it and bringing up political conversations and posting them all over social media and the news. People I knew posting, and it horrified me. I also did, for the first time in the music business, experience a direct anti Semitic attack when a famous artist texted me on Sunday after with a dozen pieces of anti Semitic hatred. I'm not going to name the name because I don't want to engage in a public dialogue of it. I did engage in a public dialogue for an artist who was accused of anti Semitism, who I knew not to be. And then, of course, I had some Jewish friends up, upset with me for doing so. As this war set in, I started to feel alone and isolated. I had my family and I had my close Jewish friends, but so few were actually checking in on me. And it was a common theme that I've heard from other people within our music community and elsewhere. There was tremendous silence from so many that were close who I as an advocate had stood up for, who are not standing up for me and for us. The ones who did check in, I joked on Instagram that they should make me their emergency contact because I will be there for them for anything. And I want to share some advice that I got from a friend outside the music business because I asked him, I said, my career as a lawyer was to translate difficult topics for all different types of people. But I don't know how to talk to people about this. And his advice to me was to talk about my pain, that everybody can relate to pain. And if they are my friend, they will understand the pain and that the political messaging may be off. And that is the advice I wanna give to everybody on this Zoom. Talk about your pain. Talk about what you're going through. Share your trauma. Everybody can empathize when it's more personal and less global. And that's part of the reason why Daniel and I thought it was so important to do this Zoom is that we sensed a little bit of a loss of the old music community that was so close-knit, and we wanted to bring everybody together again. Everybody seems to be on group chats and on social media, but not connected like they used to be as a community. And people were expressing to me in the group chats that this, this is what they desire. I joined the board of directors this year, as Daniel mentioned, and it was only three and a half weeks ago when I had my first board meeting when this all happened. I really didn't know anything beyond our annual luncheon that so many of you come to, and we see the slides in the videos and people talk about the work. But being on these board briefings, seeing them mobilize at 8 a.m. Sunday morning the next day, an immediate rele release, $10 million, and by Tuesday, a rally outside the UN with the governor and the mayor and the attorney general, it made me feel like I wasn't just observing, I was part of helping. And I want to say to you all that the UJA is a force as a global NGO, even though it's a small local community in our eyes. Our mu music community has done so much good the last couple of weeks in Israel and here for Jewish and Arab communities on the border. And Daniel and I thought this Zoom could share with all of you how you have been making a difference through your support of the UJA. So with that, I want to introduce you to a man who has been on the ground in Israel the past two weeks. He was there when the terrorist attack happened. He already went back a second time to Israel, and now he's back with us. And he has led one of the most incredible responses to any humanitarian crisis I have ever seen. He is the selfless CEO of the UJA, a tremendous humanitarian and leader. Please welcome Eric Goldstein. Thanks so much, uh, Doug, uh, for your leadership. Uh, incredible to have your father with us. And Daniel has been 
uh, leading us in this uh, entertainment lifestyle tech division for a long time. As, as Doug mentioned, uh, it's wonderful to have so many of you on this call coming together in this incredibly dark moment. Uh, there are over 250 people, 250 people screens uh, right now. I was in Israel the day it happened, October 7. I've been in Israel and back in New York now, but was there for most of the last uh, two weeks, including with Governor Hochul. Um, it's hard to imagine uh, the extent of the horror. We all read the stories, the deliberate mutilation, uh, murder, burning of elderly children. Uh, it's horrific. Uh, we actually met with a lot of victims and their families. Um, and actually speaking to them, um, it's indescribable. This is a tiny country. It's the size of New Jersey. And can you imagine 1,400 people uh, uh, killed, 200 plus kidnapped, thousands seriously wounded. Everyone in Israel knows someone who has been killed or kidnapped, and there's a sense of collective mourning and grief. I think following up on what Daniel mentioned, it's really critical to understand that the communities that were massacred on October 7, this is not part of like 1967 disputed borders. These are not settlements that have been contested land. These are the original 1948 borders of Israel. These were the frontier towns that have been there from the very beginning. Parents, grandparents, grandchildren living there for decades and decades. Um, and many of the people there devoting their lives to coexistence. We have to be concerned with innocent suffering of people of all sides. But let's also be clear that Hamas's original charter has been the destruction of the state of Israel, its total eradication. Its frame is Palestine from river to sea shall be free. We're not talking about two-state solution. We're talking about the eradication of the Jewish state and the eradication of Jewish people living in the Middle East. Um, there's enormous unpredictability ahead. Uh, you know, there are uh, ground troops massing on the Gaza border. It's unclear whether uh, the Hezbollah in the north will become more active. We worry about growing, growing concerns from the West Bank. So enormous uncertainty. But what we do know with great certainty is the extent of the current need. There are currently over 200,000 Israelis from the south and the north who have been displaced, refugees now in their own country. Many of them fled the south with nothing but the clothes on their own back. And these are people who never wanted or asked for anything, who are now, you know, literally with nothing. There are 10 cities going up in Ramat Gan on the edge of Tel Aviv and a lot, because there aren't enough current housing units to address the displaced in the current uh, uh, center of Israel. Um, as Doug mentioned, uh, UJA, uh, has been there supporting the towns in the south and the north for decades. Uh, my predecessor, John Rusquet, a very famous expression, in the wake of 9-11, with all the work we did in New York, he said uh, we were there on 9-11 doing all we did. Of course, we were there on 9-10. Uh, and in this instance, it's very true in Israel. Uh, on October 7, literally hours after the events, uh, this massacre, uh, we convened our executive committee uh, first time we ever did so on a Sabbath, on a Shabbat. Uh, we took an immediate $10 million out of our uh, endowment. Uh, and one of the few bright spots is that beyond our 10 million, the communal support, the outpouring of support has been dramatic. We've raised, in addition to our $10 million, over $115 million, $115 million in the community over the last two weeks. Uh, and as of this morning, we've already sent out $33 million to hospitals, to first responders, to communities in the South and North, trying to figure out and get their people to safety, to trauma organizations, uh, to every kind of organization, to volunteerism. There are thousands and thousands of volunteers. We've just put in the chat uh, a listing of the current $33 million in grants, but it's just the beginning. We know that there are the immediate needs, then there are going to be the intermediate needs, and then there are going to be the long-term needs that are probably going to be the greatest of all. How do you take whole cities and restore them? 
these communities down south literally do not exist anymore. So we're grateful. We know that so many companies and individuals across your industries have been so involved and stepped up. People like Clive, you've condemned the attacks. You've donated to our Israel Emergency Fund. You've encouraged the match donations. And we ask you, as Daniel said at the start, do not be silent. Do not be silent for arguments about moral equivalence. We can be sympathetic to the suffering of innocent Gazans, but yet recognize with moral clarity that, that, that Hamas's goal is not a coexistence. It's not two states. It's the eradication of a Jewish state. It's the eradication of Jewish people living in the Middle East. Thanks so much to all of you for speaking out. We hope many, many more in all of your industries will continue to do so. We're very, 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 very grateful. This is a time of immense challenge uh, for the Jewish community, both in Israel, but very much here too. I'd like now to introduce uh, Dalia Kushner. Uh, she works at the Jewish Agency for Israel, one of our primary overseas partners. One of the first things we did was give $2 million to their Victim of Terror Fund, which is now supporting over 4,000 families uh, with immediate basic needs uh, as a result of families that have been displaced, families uh, who have uh, loved ones who have been murdered are now kidnapped. Uh, Dalia also tragically has uh, relatives, Yair and Eitan, who are currently kidnapped and in Gaza. Uh, Dalia, thanks so much for being us, being with us today, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Hi, Shalom, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll I'll try to share quickly what happened to my family on October 7th and since then. So as everyone, we woke up at 6.30 a.m. because of the siren. I live in Kfar Saba, which is in the center of Israel with my husband and my two kids. We ran fast to the safe room. And then after closing the door, the first thing we did was texting my brother-in-law. His name is Yair Horn, and he lives in Kibbutz Niroz. Uh, in the south, very close to to the border with Gaza. Um, he told us that they are being under missiles as well, and that he is at the safe room with his brother, my other brother-in-law, which his name is Eitan. Uh, he lives in Kfar Saba, but he went to the kibbutz to spend the weekend with his brother. So after 10 minutes, we were safe in Kfar Saba in the center. We walked out of the safe room and we tried to go back to sleep. Obviously we couldn't, so we started reading the news and then we saw those horrific news about terrorists entering Israel and, and going around the kibbutzim. We texted them over and over again. At first they answered us that they're still in the safe room, that they heard those news. They don't know what's going on, but at 8.28, uh, AM was the last message that we got from them uh, saying that they're still in, in the safe room and, and they, they don't know uh, what, what's going on outside. We kept, we kept on messaging. Uh, we got no answer. We were still optimistic. We thought that maybe they ran out of battery in their cell phones or there's no signal inside the safe room. We, we could never imagine something like like this happening to them or or to to anyone uh, as as days as as time went by we started texting other friends at the kibbutz asking everyone was saying we don't know we don't know stop asking us there are terrorists entering our home trying to enter to our safe rooms we just don't know we 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 felt like we could not we couldn't we just couldn't breathe and we just waited at 8 p.m. The Israeli army uh, had managed to take over the, the kibbutz and apparently to take or to kill all the terrorists. And they started going house by house, checking what's going on with all the families. And then at 9 p.m. we got a message saying that they're missing, they're, they're not there. We started asking, what do you mean? We wanted to take a car and drive down to the south to see where they are or to see if we can help them. We understood that this is something which is impossible. 
uh, sirens were, were were all the time, and and all the south was was under uh, attack. And and I can say that since that moment where we heard this word missing, um, our our life just uh, stopped till till today till now. Um, we don't know where they are. We've been told by the army that they're either missing or kidnapped. They don't know. They think that they're kidnapped and they're inside Gaza, but the truth is that they don't know exactly. We don't know whether they're living, if 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 they're injured, if something happened to, to them. We, we just have no clue what's going on. And it's been more than two weeks, almost three, and and... And that's it. There's nothing we can do. We just sit on waiting. I've tried. I organized a Zoom call with the president of Argentina because both of them they made Aliyah from Argentina. Here you can see that picture. These are the three uh, siblings. The one in the middle is my husband Amos. The one on the right is Yair, the oldest, and the one on the left is Eitan. Uh, the three of them dedicate their lives to to education and working with teens in in different structures in different places. They love Israel. They made Aliyah out of Zionism and, and they made Aliyah because they thought that this is going to be a safe place for them, something that Argentina was not. And 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 that's the just very hard to explain how something like this happened to them and to all the other uh, families. Um, so, so we're part of this organization, which is uh, the organization for for the families of the missing and kidnapped people, and we're trying to get information. But the the truth is that no one knows. We know that their house was not burned, while most of their kibbutz was was uh, was burned, and we know that they're not. Uh, they they couldn't see any violence evidence, as they say, on their walls or or on their doors um i don't know if any if everyone knows but kibbutz niroz uh, is a kibbutz that before this attack they had 400 members living in the kibbutz and 100 are missing uh, they were either uh, killed or abducted and or or missing as i said before which is one out of four which is an enormous number and very hard to to understand um this is my story and 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 i'm sharing because i think that as someone said before when you share your pain and your personal story uh most of the time it gets to the heart of the people who are listening and and i want my two brother-in-law uh Eitan and Yair, uh, to to get to your heart but not only them because we're talking about 222 uh people who were kidnapped. Uh, we're talking about more than 30 kids who are inside Gaza, God knows where. We're talking about the youngest of them. Among them is a baby who is 10 months old. And, and, and as a mother and as a human being, just trying to imagine what, what are they going through and, and, and everything. And, and hopefully we want to see them back, but we, we just don't know. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I just want to say two short things as 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 a pledge, as as something that I wanna I wanna ask you. So the first thing is, as everyone said before, please use your voice, please use your influence on on every stage, on every place you're going and walking, so that the world will know and understand that they need to to condemn this horrible massacre, that they will know that killing and rape and, and, and abducted babies uh, uh, are not things that can be done. And, and, and we need your support because Israel is being attacked twice. The first, the first part is on the ground. And unfortunately, it looks like it's going to be a long war this time because it's not coming only from Gaza. It's coming now from the north in Lebanon and and maybe more. We just don't know. But the second attack, which is not only on Israel, is on all the Jewish people inside Israel and outside of Israel. People are actually afraid to use their kippah. Uh, people are afraid to go to their Jewish day schools or just to be Jewish outside of their homes. And and this is something that 
cannot happen, I think, in, in 2023. Um, and the second thing is, is everyone here is part of the entertainment industry and they always use the phrase, uh, the show must go on. And I wanna repeat that since October 7, the, the show is not going on for us, for, for the families of, of the kidnapped uh, people. Um, we stopped eating, we stopped sleeping, we stopped our everyday things. We just sit at our homes and we wait to, to, to get any news or message for, from them. We go to demonstrations, we do everything we can, but actually there's not much, I think, within Israel that we can do. And, and we need you. We need you to, to not go on with the show and make sure that all the efforts, international efforts and, and everything that can be uh, done is, is, is being done. So we can get more information and, and know where they are and, and help us bring them back home safe, please. Good. Uh, thank you, Dahlia. That was heartbreaking and heartwarming at the same time. And uh, somebody asked me yesterday, what can we do? And I said, I'll give you three things. You can pray in your own way, whatever religion you are. You must pray. You must light candles. You could do tefillin in the morning. Number two, reach out to somebody you might know in Israel through a connection or six degrees of separation and send them a hug, whether it's a call or text. And three, give, give generously, wherever you can. Uh, I'd like to invite Julie Swidler on this call now to help wrap it, wrap it up. I know it's gonna be difficult for Julie to speak at this point. She's in London. Julie, you there? I can't tell if my video, oh yes, you're, okay. You're on. You're on. Okay, thank you. I, <laughs> I wanna thank Clive and, and Daniel and Doug and Eric, and particularly Dahlia, for your powerful messages. And Dahlia, I think we're all praying for the safe return of Yair and Eitan and all of the other hostages that um, we need We need to have them come home. Uh, I, like so many, am still reeling from the inhuman attack on Israel on October 7th. We cannot forget. As the news events move on, we must re remind everyone about how this started and how it, it, we cannot forget. Just like many events in our history, it is a turning point that reminds us of where we stand in the world. While we have mourned with so many others, based on our belief in tikkun olam. Instead of mourning with us, so many have marched against us. Not anti-Israel, anti-Jew. It reminds us of why we need a state of Israel. President Biden reminded us of, a, of something that Golda Meir said to him when he was concerned about defending the state of Israel. It's hard for me to get this out. And she said, don't worry, Mr. Biden, we will defend Israel to the end because we have nowhere else to go. I would like to make a comment that um, uh, Doug made I have to say that I have been incredibly happy and fortunate that so many of my colleagues, some of who are on the phone now, who are not Jewish, who have reached out to me personally over email and others and come into my office just to give me a hug. As Jews, our hearts go out to all concerned, innocent people like innocent Palestinians who want peace. We have to continue to support Israel. I also wanna reiterate 
that the UJA is here for our friends and family in Israel as they endure this unthinkable crisis. They are also here for all of us as we struggle in our day-to-day -day jobs, figuring out how to work with our chief diversity officers and others within our organizations on how to continue to support the Jewish employees and friends and how we can continue to support Israel in its health. Don't hesitate to reach out to your UJA staff contact to learn more. I'm sorry, I'm like ugly crying, I apologize. <laughs> Before we end, I hope you will stay on for a few minutes to watch a powerful video of Israeli children singing a rendition of Stand By Me. Thank you for joining us. Our hearts are with the people of Israel and we pray for peace soon. Thank you, Julie. Uh, sorry to make you go at the end. I, I can't imagine what that was like for you, but uh, thank you. <laughs> came from your heart. Um, if you happen to be in New York City this evening at 6 p.m., you could join us at the UJA building. Uh, John Pollan and Rachel Goldberg, you may have seen them in the newspaper or in magazines the last few days. They spoke at the UN this morning. Their son, Hirsch, is being held hostage. Uh, they will be here at 6 p.m. with Governor Hochul, who's been pretty incredible. To RSVP, reach out to Ali Nade, and I think there's a... Uh, uh, her email is in the chat right now. If you'd like to attend, uh, we'd love to have you join us uh, tonight with Governor Hochul and the parents in this very unfortunate circumstance. So in wrapping up, uh, before we watch this powerful video, as Julie just mentioned, thank you, Clive Davis, for your leadership, your compassion, your honesty, and always being there. And as I said, this man has brought us all so much joy and he stepped up and stepped out last week, as he always has. I'm just proud to know Clive and everybody in the entertainment business should be a little bit Clive Davis in their life. Besides his exquisite taste, he stands for the right things. To thank his son, Doug, who's a dear friend, a board member, who has been, as they say, baptized by fire in his first 90 days as a board member. I don't think he can imagine what has gone on. Eric Goldstein for being on the ground for us and his leadership. Dahlia, we pray for you and your family. We thank you for your honest words. We will remember and pray and be there. And Julie Swidler, thank you. <clears throat> Safe travels in England. And uh, thank you all for being on here. And as Julie said, we're all scared. We're all nervous. Call us. I'm here. Doug is here. And call your UJA rep who you've met over the years, whether it's Carolyn or Ali or Eric <clears throat> or Mark, we're here. So thank you. Hopefully we'll see a few of you tonight. And please watch this powerful video. Thank you for joining today. We, the children in Israel, are going through very sad, scary, and difficult times. We wanted to ask you for only one thing. from
tumble to the sea Stand by No, I won't be afraid No, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand